So these are my disclosures. So uh, before uh, this session, actually in the previous session, it has been uh, raised several times how important is uh, the classification that we have right now uh, for patients with colorectal cancer, especially based on the genomic and transcriptomic data, and I'm not going to stand on that uh, with the four different subtypes, but also the group of uh, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Beck very nicely addressed that um, there could be a correlation with uh, the full genomic and transcriptomic profile of the patients that uh, they had in this series, and this is a series of more than 1,400 patients, but also with the um, uh, immune infiltration analysis that uh, they did. And as uh, he very nicely mentioned, uh, we can make some kind of correlations between the different subtypes and how the immune infiltration analysis uh, behaves in this particular setting. As mentioned, for the CMS-1 uh, MSI population, this is a population that is infiltrated by, by T cells and CTLs. So there are the genes that are, are regulated are genes related to either cytokines or uh, immune checkpoints, as you can see here. Also, there is a little bit of of regulation of complement, but not so much. But the most important thing here for this population is that they have high MHC class one upregulation, uh, related genes of regulation. So this is really very important. On the other hand, the mesenchymal, this is the, this is the immune excluded or um, inflammatory um, uh, um, inflamed uh, tumors. Uh, basically, you can see that there is no upregulation or not, not really a very important upregulation of the cytokines or the ch immune checkpoints. But, uh, but on the other hand, there is a regulation of the genes related to uh, myeloid-derived uh, uh, suppressor cells. So this is really important because this is a really a very repressive phenotype. And also other genes related to T-Rex, for example, uh, TGF-beta uh, uh, picking up uh, among all the others. And also complement is upregulated. So basically, there is inflammation, but uh, most of the cells are actually immune uh, suppressive cells. But the, most, uh, the majority of the tumors actually CMS2 and CMS3, you can see that there are desserts, so they have not any kind of, of uh, T cell infiltration. But more importantly, actually, the, the MHC class 1 related genes uh, are really down regulated rather than up regulated. So it's important to know uh, this um, constitution because, in this way, actually, in a very simplistic way, we can describe uh, three different populations of patients with colorectal cancer. The first one, the CMS1, obviously, hypermutation is the driver um, uh, of these tumors either by uh, mismatch repair deficiency or by other mechanisms. But in this particular case, uh, the immune cycle is activated from the early beginning with uh, neoantigens. So Th1 cells, uh, T cells, actually infiltrate the, the tumors and, and, and thereafter macrophages, NK cells, and CTLs. And basically, the only way that the cancer cell can react to that is upregulating up PDL1. And this is the reason why PD1, PDL1 inhibitors work in this population. The others, the immune tolerant or the, uh, the inflamed tumors, these are uh, the CMS4. And here, the, the principal mechanism of, uh, of generation of this tumor is related to inflammation. And therefore, there is a regulation of TGF, beta, and complement. What actually attracts myeloid that are suppressor cells and, and and T17 uh, cells that are specific uh, uh, a subset of uh, T cells that actually uh, secrete uh, interleukin 17, and this is re really related to the to the Treg phenotype as well as monocytes. The important po um, point here is that with all these cells and the repressive cytokines, actually this uh, prevents uh, macrophages, uh, NK cells, and and, uh, and cytotoxic T cells to invade the tumor. So this is really a very repressive um, phenotype. But again, the most important important uh, part of uh, patients actually are immune deserts, so no infiltration. So how can we do um, with uh, potential immunotherapy approaches in this particular setting? Well, obviously, recognizing the first one, it's very clear that as these tumors actually upregulate PDL1, PDL, PD1, PDL1 inhibitors should work. And this was very nicely presented by initially by the group of John Hawkins and other colleagues, uh, Dr. Lee, uh, in the seminal publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, basically showing that those patients with colorectal cancer and mismatch repair deficiency, they had a 62% response rate with pembrolizumab. And the overall survival and the progression fee survival, you can see here, really, it's, um, um, it's, it's outstanding for this population of patients. And also, uh, this has led to several clinical studies just to validate this. This is in the refractory setting with pembrolizumab as a single agent, but also another phase three study in the first line setting that com com compares conventional chemotherapy full thoughts with the basisumab uh, versus uh, pembrolizumab as a single um, agent, and these studies are ongoing. 
Also, the other PD-1 inhibitor, uh, nivolumab, has been evaluated also in this particular population of patients uh, in the cohort of, of MSI tumors. And in this particular study, the check made 142. A cohort of patients was, was treated with nivolumab as a single agent, and another cohort was treated with nivolumab combined with epilumumab. Obviously, uh, this data has been presented at the ASCO uh, 2016 meeting and also the ASCO GI 2017 meeting. And basically, uh, for the nivolumab single agent uh, group of patients, uh, you can see that there is a consistent uh, response rate around 30% of the patients. It doesn't matter whether uh, the MSI test was done locally or central, but uh, the response rate is around 30%. So um, in the very preliminary data that, that compare uh, the cohort of patients treated with um, a nivolumab or uh, with nivolumab and epilumab, actually we didn't see major differences in the response rate, although some more patients actually had stable disease. And again, this is preliminary data. Um, perhaps the, the, the important message here is that when you compare um, the spaghetti plots uh, between the two different cohorts and also the waterfall plots, we cannot see dramatic differences, although that I, I would say that this is really um, preliminary and very early uh, to address uh, final conclusions on whether a CTL4 inhibitor um, uh, incorporated to nivolumab actually produce, in, increases the response rate and the, and the survival curves. In this particular study, also the more recent update for the patients treated with nivolumab, um, uh, you can see that the survival uh, curve is uh, quite impressive with uh, the median not reached uh, with, uh, with this follow-up and more than 70% 70, 70 of the patients uh, being alive uh, after one year on treatment. So this is really very, very important data. And also another question for this particular population is whether um, patients that have uh, MSI status uh, respond independently, they have VRAF uh, mutations or they have VRAF wild type tumors. And actually, you can see that uh, the two populations actually respond. Potentially, more patients with, um, with uh, wild type tumors respond to nivolumab, but also you can see activity in patients that have VRAF mutations. And the same for whether the background um, uh, genotypic status is related to Lynch syndrome history or not. You can see that there are responses in the two cohorts of patients with uh, uh, tumors, uh, MSI tumors associated with Lynch syndrome, but also in tumors that do not have this kind of association. So very clear that for this population, PD-1, uh, PD-L1 inhibitors with or without CTL4 inhibitors and potentially with other immune checkpoint agonists or antagonists uh, may work. And this is work in progress in this particular population. But again, what I mentioned before is that the most important population of patients with colorectal cancer are immune neurons without uh, T cell infiltrations, naturally with low MHC class one related genes expression. So it's very important to keep this in mind because obviously for this population of patients, we have to think on other immunotherapy approaches. One has been commented before, um, as we know that uh, MEK inhibitors actually can upregulate MHC class one related genes uh, in several preclinical models actually has been shown that uh, uh, when these models are treated with MEK inhibitors, actually there is this kind of uh, upregulation and also there is um, intratumoral uh, T cell accumulation and this translates in these um, xenographs or PDX models in uh, sustained uh, tumor growth control when you use a uh, MEK inhibitor with a PDL1 inhibitor in this particular case. This was translated in the clinics, and Johanna Vendel presented this data a year ago. And basically, for the population of patients with colorectal cancer, MSS tumors, although the numbers are really limited, you can see that in this population where you wouldn't expect any activity for a MEK inhibitor or for a PDL1 inhibitor, actually 20% um, of the patients achieve partial response, and uh, additional 20% of the patients achieve a stable disease. As you you can see here. So this is something that we wouldn't expect with either a uh, PDL1 inhibitor or a MEK inhibitor. And actually, on the basis of uh, this um, limited data, I would say clinical data, um, the Cotesso trial is comparing this combination, covimetinib plus atezolizumab versus atezolizumab as a single agent or with one of the standards of care uh, in this particular setting like regorafenib. Obviously, uh, this study is especially enriched for patients that have uh, RAS mutations and MSS tumors. 
So what about an other potential mechanisms to engage the immune cycle in this immune desert population? So basically, uh, uh, a group of compounds are actually being developed in this setting. So one of them is cytokine constructs, for example, directed to CA, but also some really very interesting data with biospecific antibodies that bind at the same time to CD3 uh, uh, for the T cells, but also to, other, to any potential receptor in the malignant cell, in this particular case, like CA. And we have in here T cell by specific antibodies, but also bites uh, that uh, uh, target the, the two receptors. And in this, in this uh, meeting, actually, Guillermo Giles has presented the update of this um, clinical study combining CATCV, that it's uh, T cell by a specific antibody with a novel 2 to 1 format, that it's directed at the same time to uh, CD3 and uh, with two sites also binds to um, uh, CA in this particular cases, in this particular case. So this is a very flexible antibody that uh, allows that for uh, um, uh, a complex binding to the, to the malignant cell, but obviously um, highly uh, directed to cells that have high expression of CA. The bottom message here is that with uh, this particular compound, we, um, with this uh, dual binding to um, CD3 and to uh, CA, we see um, T cell engagement and activation in the tumors uh, with uh, eventual uh, cell killing by delivery of cytotoxic granules, but also we, we do see T cell proliferation at, at the site of the tumor. On the basis of this, actually, uh, two clinical studies, one with this compound as a single agent, and another one in combination with a tesolizumab, were launched. And as you can see here, uh, there were responses uh, in this very refractory population of patients with colorectal cancer with the single agent CATCV, but especially with the combination of uh, CATCV and a tesolizumab. So this is really very important, and we, there is actually a, a slight trend for a correlation between the CATCB dose, at, especially at higher doses of 80 and 160 milligrams with response. But if we were to the, to the spaghetti plots, actually, this is the global population of patients with colorectal cancer that have been treated with a combination at all doses, and even in this global population, uh, patients, obviously, some of them treated at, at, at low doses that are not effective. You can see that at a glance, 50% of the patients have any kind of benefit, like stable disease or even uh, partial responses. And you can see that some of them are really uh, prolonged on time. But if we focus now on the 11 patients with MSS tumors, refractory patients, these were patients were treated on fourth line or beyond, and, and, and treated at doses of uh, 80 or 160 milligrams of CA, TCV, actually you can see that 80% of the patients have any kind of benefit. Only two patients presented as the best response progression of the disease, but all the others presented either stable disease or partial response. And as you can see, some of these responses are ongoing. Obviously, this is preliminary data, only 11 patients treated at, the, at very active doses, but um, uh, um, to me, um, um, this, um, this activity is remarkable because we wouldn't expect any kind of activity in this population of patients with um, a PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitor as a single agent. And this is like um, how uh, the response uh, in, in a patient with an MSS tumor, metastasic colorectal cancer, looks like with this combination. Uh, on the left side, you can see the, the PET scans uh, with this dramatic uh, partial metabolic response at week four compared to the baseline uh, CT scan. But more importantly, when you look at the conventional CT scans, this impressive uh, partial response, actually almost complete response in this lung metastasis from uh, colorectal cancer. So this is really very impressive. So other approaches to engage the immune cycle in this population of patients with immune desert um, colorectal cancers actually comprises uh, vaccines like anti-tumor vaccines or uh, dendritic cell vaccines directed to any, any protein in the malignant cell like, for example, CEA and MOOC1. This is one approach. Another approach, obviously, is to uh, engage um, um, 
immune cells um, uh, with adaptive cell therapy um, uh, in this particular population of patients. And this includes uh, clinical trials with TILs, with CAR T cells, either directed to CEA or to EGFR, and also cytokine-induced uh, killer cells. Obviously, these are small trials. From, uh, these trials are ongoing, and we have to wait for the, for the clinical activity. But at the end, the important message here is that we are trying to engage this immune response in this population of cells, uh, patients that are immune naive. Just to sum up, if we think about the major population of patients uh, in colorectal cancer, for the CMS-1 uh, subgroup, and this is the group immune, obviously most of these patients uh, are going to have mid match repair deficiency and MSI status, and we know it has been shown that these patients actually, most of them, benefit from PD-1, PD-L1 blockage. But what about the others? Actually, we have other mechanisms why these patients may have an MSI-like status or they are hypermutated, like, for example, those patients that have pol E mutations. And we do think that these patients may eventually benefit also from PD-L1 inhibitors, and this is something that's being evaluated as we speak. But what about the others, the MSS population? So in basically here, we, um, um, the hypothesis that we have is that for the CMS2 population and the CMS3 population, actually the strategy may be a pd one PD1 uh, inhibitor plus uh, epigenetic modulation, as Rodrigo Dinsman mentioned before, also MEK inhibitors as the Coteso trial is trying to demonstrate, or uh, this approach of uh, by specific antibodies in order to engage T cells into the tumor. And what about the other population, the CMS4? As mentioned, uh, this is a very immune repressive uh, phenotype. So in here, we should um, uh, test uh, combinations of inhibitors of the immune suppression status, like, for example, TGF beta inhibitors, also with um, immune stimulatory drugs, um, uh, just uh, um, 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 enhancing the, the immune check points uh, that are um, agonistic for the, for the uh, intervention of the immune function. So basically, the hope is that not only for the MSI population, but especially for the MSS population, we try to convert these immune desert, immune cold uh, tumors to a more immune hot environment where uh, these uh, immunotherapy approaches may produce uh, benefit for our patients. Thank you for your attention.